r slash no sleep posted by you slash born beach i don't celebrate halloween anymore halloween 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 what a time of year ain't it i still remember my first halloween my first real halloween mind you not the manufactured bullshit they shovel down our throats year after year i'm talking about all hallows eve i'm talking about Samhain. I'm talking about the one night of the year when monsters walk the earth. I was 11 years young when I first experienced the horror of Halloween. I'd been out with a friend, roaming the streets with bags full of wrappers and stomachs full of candy. We'd been out looking for some fun. Some excitement. See, once you reach a certain age plain old trick or treating doesn't really do it anymore. No, you need something special. Something terrifying. I think that's why we took a stroll down Blackbriar Lane. I think that's why we went looking for the decrepit one, in all his wicked glory. I think that's why I watched somebody die. But I'm getting ahead of myself, aren't I? Yes, I suppose that I am. So let's rewind. Backtrack. Allow me to set the scene. It's October 31st and the night air is crisp, the leaves are red and gold and the neighborhood is lit up in jack-o'-lanterns and full moons. There's mischief in the air. There's murder. Earlier that week, a kid dies. They find his body floating down the river like he's out for a swim, except he's fully dressed and missing his head. You ever tried to identify a body without a head? Without teeth? Well, apparently it's easy. See, little Greggy Hall had a nice mom, the sort that most of us can only dream of having, and the lovely lady went ahead and stitched his name right into the side of his jacket. Just like that, we knew who was dead. Open and shut. Case closed. But what was he doing dead, without his head? floating down the river when he should have been in bed. Was it a prank gone wrong? Maybe the poor kid slipped walking across the trestle? Or maybe, just maybe, somebody sick and twisted was out for blood, and innocent little Greggy was too good a target to pass up. Who could say? Truth is, nobody had a clue not the sheriff, not his mother, not a single soul in town could have told you how little Greggy came to find himself so waterlogged and pale. But here's the thing about secrets, none of them last forever. This one didn't even last the week. It was me and Andy who figured it out, late on Halloween night. We took the turn down Blackbriar Lane because that was the way you made it into Shelton Wood, and that was the place they'd found Greggy Hall's decapitated corpse. Before I go any further, I want you to know that I don't mean Greggy any disrespect. He was a good kid. A kind kid. That night though, in the heart of October, he had become so much more than that. He'd become a legend. A ghost story come to life. That night, Greggy Hall became the reason I don't celebrate Halloween. That night I crossed Blackbriar Bridge with Andy Delton, and together the two of us walked into Shelton Wood. The trees there are like nowhere else. They're thick. Almost so thick that they press in on each other like blades of grass, smothering for space. Once you step beneath the Shelton canopy, it really doesn't matter if the moon is crescent or full as the sun, you're not going to see a damn thing. It's dark in there. Desperately so. We used our flashlights to navigate doing our best not to tear our costumes on the branches as we passed. My mother had spent all month sewing my Dracula outfit, and Andy had saved up half a year's allowance for his Spider-Man getup. We weren't about to walk out of there full of rips and holes. No way. But we had work to do. See, Andy and I knew something about Shelton that not the sheriff or Greggy's mother or even the pastor knew. We knew that Greggy Hall had been talking about hearing voices in the woods on the way home from school. We knew he'd said he saw something watching him from the trees. We knew all of this because his sister, Sally, was in our grade, and she'd told us about how religious their mother was. How fanatical. She'd told us her mother once convinced the pastor to drag Sally into those woods and perform an exorcism on her. She told us she thought her mother's paranoia was starting to wear off on poor little Greggy. So when Greggy started talking about hearing voices, seeing things, we thought it was just nonsense. Make believe. After all. He wasn't describing seeing a man, woman or animal in the trees. He was describing a something. A monster. He was describing seeing a nightmare come to life and even out here, in this little slice of nowhere on the edge of the map, we knew that monsters weren't real. Or, we thought we did. But then pop goes little Greggy's head, and the next thing you know, we're fast believers. So fast in fact that we brought the news straight to the police. Guess what happened then? They chucked our statements into a drawer and told us they'd look into it. First the damn pastor wants to ban access to Shelton Wood and now kids are saying it's haunted. We heard them laughing all the way up until the door closed behind us. Town full of nut jobs. No, it was up to us. 
We thought about inviting Greggy's sister along, but we knew she wanted time alone. Time to mourn her brother. That was fine by us. This whole thing, this little investigation of ours was just a scouting mission anyway. We weren't expecting to encounter the creature that stalked Greggy Hall from the trees. We weren't expecting to fight for our lives. But then, these things so rarely go according to plan. We spent an hour roaming Shelton before we realized we were lost. We'd been trying to follow the river, but at one point Andy swore he heard muttering coming from over the hill, and so the two of us clambered up it to investigate. All we found nothing were old pine trees and empty dark. We turned around to circle back, but the river was gone. Vanished. We did our best to retrace our steps. We even followed our noses, hoping we could smell the stink of the town sewage that ran into the river, but it was no use. The river was lost, and so were we. We walked for 10, maybe 15 minutes before the sounds of the forest died. The shifting of branches, the pitter-patter of rodents starting across the dirt, the buzz of mosquitoes and even the trill of crickets all turned to silence. It was like somebody had hit the switch on a stereo. Instant quiet. Andy and I stopped to listen. To observe. And we saw something shift in the trees. A large figure, maybe twice the size of a man, with round white eyes and a long, twisting neck was perched above us on a thick branch. It clicked at us. At first we thought it was speaking, trying to communicate, but then we realized the clicking wasn't coming from its face. It was coming from its hands. Its fingers, long and crooked, seemed to splinter into separate appendages. On either one of its hands were fans of hundreds of fingers, each gripping the tree branch while their nails picked away at the bark beneath. That picking was making the clicking sound. Its fingers were. Andy tried to speak to it. He tried to ask what it was doing here, to ask whether or not it was the thing that had killed poor little Greggy Hall, as though there were any doubt in our minds. But at that moment the monster's fingers gripped the branch with such force that the entire thing snapped in two. The creature began plummeting to the earth like a giant, and I thought maybe our work would be done and gravity would put an end to it. But it let loose a shrill shriek and flapped its many fingered hands like wings, and pressed itself up into the air. It shrieked again, and its eyes, once wide and round, became an acid painting of colors, horrible and bright and anguishing. There weren't any reds or purples or greens. There were only the colors of blood, of bruises, of bile. It screeched again and then swooped toward us. My heart thundered as I threw myself to the ground, but the thing, whatever it was, caught Andy in its grip. It caught him by his head, in two feet that resembled human jaws more than anything else. They were covered in white teeth, and it was at that moment that I knew I would never see my friend again. And I think he knew too. Andy shook and hollered, he screamed and shouted but all of it was only for the span of six seconds, because not a moment later the thing clenched its jaws. Its feet. Andy's head split open like a jack-o'-lantern, his insides splattering me like a water balloon. I had to go. I turned, running full tilt from this thing. I didn't know where I was running, I didn't even know if I could reasonably run anywhere that this monster couldn't reach me, but I knew that I had to try. I had to, because if I didn't then I would end up just like Andy. Just like Greggy. As my feet pounded the earth, my heart pounded my chest. I ripped off my Dracula cloak, terrified of it tripping me up on an errant rock, and doubled over as my lungs burned. I'd never run so hard in my life. Never so fast. And it wasn't enough. Not even close. With a beat of its finger wings, the beast crashed down in front of me. It towered above me, standing over nine feet tall with its terrible technicolor eyes, swirling like promises of violence. Looking for me? It uttered, in such a low, broken voice that I almost missed it. You killed Greggy, I said. It seemed a stupid, obvious thing to say after watching my best friend's head crack open like an egg yolk, but it was all I could manage. At that moment I was so shocked, so traumatized, that I reverted to our hypothesis. Our mission. Yes, the thing said. It rose up, and now I could see it clearer. Beneath the faint scraps of moonlight that pierced the veil of leaves, I bore witness to a monster with saucer-shaped eyes, a set of long arms ending in legions of decrepit fingers and two legs that each hosted a mouth where there should have been feet. It stepped toward me, walking on its teeth. Who are you? I asked, swallowing. Are you him? The decrepit one? It took a breath, a long, harsh breath that sounded like it might have gurgled razor blades in its lungs. When it spoke, it breathed cold air onto me. I am you. It took another tooth-filled step, and I staggered backwards. My world spun, but I wasn't sure if that was because of my fear, my grief at losing Andy or the awful kaleidoscope of horror playing out in its swirling eyes. What does that mean? 
It didn't respond. It reached a hand out toward me, and its eyes swirled faster and faster, like a blender of madness, its teeth snapping as it took its next steps. Bulr, shouted a voice. The monster recoiled. Its long neck twisted like a snake as its eyes blinked and faded like a television reception dying in the storm. It curled into a ball, wrapping itself with its hundreds of fingers before disappearing into a gust of dead leaves. I took a breath. Above, the moon seemed to glow a little brighter, and beside me the sound of the river returned. Crickets filled the night. The wind whistled in my ears. It was as though the world had come back into focus, and I'd been pulled out of a dream. All because of... Hello? I said, wheeling about. There'd been a voice. A loud one, that was commanding and full of authority and speaking a language I didn't understand. But where was? Oh. There he was, down by the river. You alright, son? The pastor asked. I shook my head. No. My friend's dead aunt. Yes, I see what's left of him on your shirt. The pastor paused, looking me over. What made you go looking for that creature? It killed Greggy Hall, I sputtered. We wanted proof. No such thing, not when it comes to the decrepit one. It's closer to a thought than a being of flesh and blood. You can't take pictures of it. Can't record audio. Believe me, I've tried. It feeds off of fear. It feeds off of people like your friend, like you, who go looking for nightmares in all the right places. If it gets strong enough, we lose. He must have registered the confusion on my face. By which I mean that we die. This town. You and me. Your mother and father and sisters and brothers. All of us fall into its deadly reverie and poof off goes our heads. How do we stop it? We don't. Or, at least you don't I do. I brought it here, after all, so it only makes sense that I should be the one to risk getting rid of it. You brought it here? Yes, when I performed the exorcism on Sally Hall. It had been living in her, see? Hiding. Her mother noticed it, bless her heart, and she requested I remove the being from her daughter but, it was powerful. Too powerful for me to destroy and so instead I had to compromise. Think quickly. I swallowed the pieces beginning to line up in my head. You had to chain it here, didn't you? To this forest? The pastor nodded. It was all that I could do, he sighed, put an arm around my shoulders and told me that he'd walk me home. He explained that after what happened to Greggy he had been petitioning the mayor to block access to Sheltonwood out of respect. To have it marked as a burial ground. A memorial. He told me there had been some pushback at the time. Folks didn't want to sacrifice a slice of forest for a single dead kid, but now that the same fate had befallen Andy, he counted on the mayor changing his tune. And by the next week, the mayor had. The section of Shelton was closed off to everybody but investigators. Soon enough, even they quit coming through. It became a dead zone. A piece of the map that didn't exist anymore, far as anybody was concerned. The simple fact was there were too many bad memories. Too many reminders of the horror that had taken place there. It's been years now and I no longer celebrate Halloween. I can't. It reminds me of Andy, of little Greggy, and of the decrepit one with all its fingers. For a while there I thought I'd actually moved past all of this, left it behind me. But then tonight, I saw something from my window that sent my blood cold. Amidst the shifting clouds of the black Halloween sky, framed in the light of the moon, was a large bird. A bird with a thousand fingers on either hand, and feet lined with teeth. A bird flying away from Shelton Wood. A bird flying to town, 